So happy that you are here in the early morning. Uh, my name is Jason Schiffer. I'm a director for Coronavirus the European Harm Reduction Network. And um, I'm happy to share and moderate this event. Drug consumption rules have been implemented in Western Europe for almost 30 years. And also it is quite a controversial intervention or um, however you want to call it. We see that an increasing number of countries starts to implement and starts to operate drug consumption rule. And we believe that this is also a very good development if it is done in a good way. Because we think PCR work can work for people who use drugs to provide them with a safe place where they can use drugs. It significantly can reduce HIV and hepatitis uh, transmissions. It prevents overdose, it saves lives, and it provides a space for sharing information, mutual exchange and support. PCRs also contribute to public health. Contribu it contributes to a rational and health-oriented approach to drug policy, and it provides insights on new drug trends and drug markets, and can also inform up-to-date early warning systems. And last but not least, it can also support cities in developing sensible local drug policies and reduce public nuisance linked to drug use. Today with this uh, uh, side event, we want to uh, contribute to an informed discussion about drug consumption rooms by presenting and discussing available evidence and different models. We have a distinguished uh, list of speakers um, and with which, no much to do, I would like to go to the first speaker, this is Mr. Joao Bulao, from, he's the director of the Portuguese Institute on Addictive Behaviors and Dependencies, and unfortunately, Joao cannot be with us, but he will be joining us online. The floor. Thank you, Catherine. I hope you can, <laughs> can listen. Is the sound okay? Okay. Good morning to the uh, participants. I wish to start by thanking Correlation, European Arm, Arm Reduction Net Network, for organizing this side event and for inviting me to deliver the opening remarks. While arm reduction as a policy gained wider acceptance and expanded in Europe through the 90s, the creation of space, uh, safe spaces of local drug facilities where people who use drugs could do so under supervision of trained staff was quite controversial and politically sensitive in many countries as it was the case in Portugal. Supervised drug consumption facilities have been operating in Europe for the last three decades. These arm reduction facilities, addressing drug injecting and high risk forms of use, aim to prevent deaths from overdoses, reduce the acute risks of diseases transmission through anigenic uh, injecting, and connect people who use drugs with treatment and other health and social services. More recently, in some countries, provision has also been provided for other routes of administra administration, such as smoking or inhaling uh, of drugs. Drug consumption rooms initially evolved as a response to health and public order problems linked to open drug scenes and drug markets in cities where a network of drug services already existed but where responses were not fit to address the reality of people injecting in the streets, as well as other public order problems. They represent a local response, closely linked to policy choices, based on an evaluation of local needs. Effectiveness of supervised drug consumption facilities to reach and stay in contact with highly marginalized target populations, namely homeless and persons with mental health disorders, is widely documented. Research has also shown that the use of supervised drug consumption facilities 
is associated with self-reported reductions in injecting risk behavior, such as syringe and needle sharing. Drug consumption rooms provide drug users with sterile injecting equipment and paraphernalia for other ways of usage, counseling services before, during, and after drug consumption, emergency care in the event of overdose, primary medical care and referral to social health care and addiction treatment services, measures that counter the risk of HIV and other bloodborne diseases, transmissions, and over, of overdose deaths. In addition, the use of consumption facilities is associated with increased uptake, both of detoxification and drug-dependence treatment, including opioid substitution. As frontline low threshold services, supervised drug consumption facilities are often among the first to gain insights into, into new drug use patterns and new substances appearing in the market, thus their key role in the early identification of new and emerging trends among the high-risk population. Some facilities provide drug checking services enabling people who use drugs to have their drugs analyzed. These facilities, along with street teams, are also crucial to reach and maintain contact with high-risk people who use drugs and who are not ready or willing to quit drug use and unable to interact with the treatment system. Most of those operational in Europe also offer provision of food, showers, showers and clo clothing, clothing uh, to those living in the streets, access to internet, prevention materials and co as condoms and sharp containers, counseling and support to contact health and social welfare services. Dear participants, there are many ways to reduce drug-related harm and local authorities are, are well-placed to develop multifaceted strategies to tackle the risks and the challenges posed by drug consumption in public places to social cohesion and urban security. Drug policies must be pragmatic and seek to reduce the harm that drug use causes to the health, social well-being and security of individuals, communities and societies. They must be designed to address the needs identified by professionals and civil society organizations on the ground, and they must be able to adapt to rapidly changing policy contexts. In many cities, supervised drug consumption facilities have shown to be efficient tools for improving public health and security locally, taking people who use drugs out of the streets ensuring their, their use under safe conditions and addressing their health com comorbidities. They have also a direct impact on the number of overdoses and drug-related deaths, on the transmission of bloodborne diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C, and fosters the decrease of public nuisance. <coughs> there is no evidence to suggest that the availability of supervised drug consumption facilities increases drug use or frequency of injecting or other ways of use and do not result in higher rates of local drug-related crimes. On the contrary, they give an effective positive contribution to the, to the lives both of people who use drugs and other inhabitants of our cities, displaying a key role in the comprehensive local harm reduction strategy. The MCDDA has been instrumental in gathering and disseminating evidence and data on the effectiveness of the arm reduction of this arm reduction measure. The joint report of the MCDDA and Correlation European Arm Reduction Network on drug consumption rooms published last year contributes to an informed discussion about drug consumption rooms by analyzing the available evidence or lack of it as well as reviewing the various models being adopted and their characteristics. 
In Portugal, the legal basis for drug consumption rooms was established in 2001, but the first mobile supervised drug consumption facility opened only in 2019, followed by the launch of a fixed unit with a room to inject and another to smoke drugs in May of 2021, both in Lisbon. Another drug consumption room was opened in October 2022 in the city of Oporto. Hugo Faria will be presenting the experience of, uh, of the Lisbon Fixed Supervised Drug Consumption Room on behalf, on behalf of Arjo do Pinhal, an outstanding partner of our drug policies. I wish you a very fruitful share of the experiences and thank you again for uh, your attention. Have a very nice side event. Thank you. Thank you, Joao, for being here with us. And uh, the next speaker, so we will, idea would be that we, if you have questions or comments that we wait until everyone has presented and then we can have a discussion afterwards. Uh, next speaker is uh, Isiar Indaverui. She is the scientific agent of the EMCDBA and provides uh, support to all kinds of support, collects evidence around drug consumption. Thank you very much, Catherine. Can you hear me all well? Yes. yes. Okay. So thank you very much for the inter uh, for the invitation. I will give a very short overview of uh, the situation of drug consumption rooms in Europe. I will try not to repeat and also not focus on what uh, Roberto will be talking about later. Um, so essentially, I think if we are talking of drug consumption rooms in Europe, we are focusing on health facilities that offer uh, a space for supervised consumption as um, Goulon already said uh, these are frontline low threshold services that are usually a local response very tailored to the local needs of this response. However, they focus all on similar objectives. Um, they aim to prevent drug related overdoses and uh, overdose deaths to reduce their infection disease transmission and high uh, risk drug use. Um, to connect people and reach out to people who use drugs and connect them with treatment services and other health and social services, and also to contribute to um, diminishing public nuisance related to an open drug scene. As uh, Catherine also already mentioned uh, latest, they have been also shown to or proven to be very effective in early warning systems since they are able to detect very uh, early emerging trends among high risk drug using populations. Mm -hmm. um, a bit supporting what has been already said, I wanted to show you this figure where you can see uh, how over the last decades in European member states, um, uh, harm reduction uh, interventions have been increasingly implemented. And you can see on the right, the green line, these are drug consumption rooms that have also been scaling up in the latest years, uh, increasingly implemented in more and more European member states together uh, with other harm reduction interventions as part of a comprehensive harm reduction response. So in 2022, there were no, nine EU countries and Norway, they had already drug consumption rooms in place. And this is the map that shows a bit uh, the geographical distribution, which is pretty uh, obvious that it is not an even distribution, which has a bit to do with the uh, point that we said that it is a, a local response to local um, challenges, but it shows also very clearly that in some countries, these are already well established integrated components of the harm reduction response, regional often, but integrated. Oops, sorry, that was something happened here. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, uh, oh. The drug consumption room joint report with um, correlation has already been, re already been mentioned as one of our uh, latest oh. publications on drug consumption rooms. Also, last year, we had the update of the um, joint guideline with the EZDZ on prevention and control of infectious diseases among people who inject drug, which also has been focusing and has as a recommendation the uh, provision of drug consumption rooms. And we have our best practice portal where the effectiveness is continuously overseen. And what we have been able to detect in these is that um, 
very different study designs are being employed. So we have a, a huge heterogeneity in the type of studies that assess uh, results uh, related to drug consumption, drug consumption rooms and very often uh, very varied outcomes. So there is a big challenge when trying to summarize the evidence for the effectiveness and for the outcomes. And um, that has probably contributed to the discussion about how much evidence exists and not for this um, complex interventions. Nevertheless, there are already several systematic reviews. And in our joint report, we were able to interview four, uh, to identify four systematic reviews um, that met high quality criteria and summarized uh, evidence published between 2014 and 21. And we also um, realized and, and could uh, analyze based on this um, uh, scientific publications that evaluation is key in, in the, uh, the assessment of um, the effectiveness and understanding of such a complex intervention. And evaluation synthesis play a particular important role here and have to be focused on um, and need to be used to, for evidence-based uh, decision-making in um, such complex interventions. So um, it's no wonder that uh, a great share of the evidence that exists comes from uh, the um, evaluations of two sites um, that are outside of Europe, but uh, had programmed from the beginning a structured assessment and evaluation of the effectiveness. But we have also lately our Cosino study in France that um, uh, broadened a bit the evaluation aspect and, and looked at the impact of DZRs on health-related uh, outcomes. If we summarize that, you will usually get one of these tables where you get the, the uh, concrete, a specific outcome um, results for each outcome. But um, essentially for such a brief intervention as today, I think what is important is to summarize the key aspect. And I think key aspect is that we have sufficient evidence now to say that uh, drug consumption rooms are effective reducing overdose morbidity and mortality. There is quite a bit of evidence showing that uh, there's an uh, improvement in injection be, um, uh, or high risk injection behavior and the implementation of harm reduction strategies when uh, fast, uh, drug consumption rooms are available. And it's very plausible to think that this has an impact on the transmission of uh, drug related infectious diseases and therefore prevention. Um, and then very similar in public news zones, varied outcomes are measured, but in general, there is evidence supporting um, uh, that drug consumption rooms are effective in reducing public drug use and drug injection and uh, diminishing the, the syringes and litter surrounding. And that, uh, as already has been said, there's no effect on crime or public noise zones in, in the surroundings, there's no increase, so um, no negative impact. This all together is uh, already based on a good body of evidence, but op this is a, a developing topic and um, there are many publications coming over and many projects going on, not in Europe, but um, uh, that would expect to contribute uh, with new evidence and, and, and help to solidify what we already know. But uh, we can conclude that there is a growing body of evidence assessing different outcomes of DZRs that need to be integrated, but that can be already used. So there's evidence for the effectiveness of preventing drug-related overdoses and overdose deaths, as well as sufficient uh, for the improving, uh, improving access to treatment for people who use drugs. We have uh, sufficient uh, evidence that um, uh, drug consumption rooms uh, improve uh, high-risk uh, behavior, injection behavior on pe um, among people who inject drugs. And it is plausible to think that this can prevent transmission of diseases, H HIV, so hepatitis C and HIV. Then there is also a uh, positive measure of uh, impact on, on abscesses and other infections or emergency visits and other benefits have been proven like, um, as I said, uh, on public injecting and uh, litter uh, or uh, injection litter in the surroundings. However, I think a big conclusion is that evaluations need to focus on a broader assessment, including impact and an integrated evaluation of the different aspects. Um, and uh, some to mention uh, is like the accessibility, the acceptability and um, cost effectiveness aspects of these interventions. And that's all. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Ziar, for summarizing in such a comprehensive way the evidence. We know how important it is to have it. And now, after um, focusing on evidence, and uh, we will go to more the practical part. Uh, the next speaker is Roberto Perez Dario. He is uh, head of policy at Correlation European Harm Reduction Network and also coordinating the European Network of Drug Consumption. Hi, thank you everybody for joining and coming. <clears throat> in this uh, six minutes, what I would like to do is a tiny bit deal on what has been done in here. And I will be presenting some preliminary results on a DCR census that we're going to be posting already in a couple of weeks. It will be online. Normally, one of the activities that I do from correlation from the European Network of Drug Consumption Rooms is trying to understand at any rate of what is the situation when it comes to supervision, different operational characteristics, capacities, and also what is a bit the field of drug consumption rooms in Europe. The last time we did it was 2017, and then we decided to repeat it again in the last year because a lot of changes have been happening. And also, a lot of the emphasis that we tried to do this time is have a bit of a look or a reflection. So was what has been happening in these drug consumption rooms since the beginning of their opening, because that also gives us a bit of an understanding of the measures we're speaking about the evidence that is generated, but also to understand what is the impact that they have been having in there in the yeah, in the context. Uh, I'm gonna be uh, updating if you are your chart with a more updating chart from March 2024 on the number of drug consumption rules in Europe. At the moment, we are counting 101 drug consumption rules in Europe. Thanks to the members of the network, every year we are also doing a, a census on this. However, it is important to notice that what we are counting in here as a drug consumption room is those facilities or locations in which drug consumption room is directly uh, accompanied or supervised. That means that there's many other services and reduction services in which drug use is taking place, but at the moment they are not counting and they are challenging at any bit the definition of what a drug consumption room is. For example, in housing for services, oftentimes as crime reduction measure, use is supported within facilities, but because it's independent housing, there is nobody that directly is supporting that use. So we see that also <clears throat> the notion of what a drug consumption room is starting to merge and to shift, and then I'm gonna provide a bit more intelligence. In principle, in the, in the study that we did, which is important for you to know that the covers, it was not <clears throat> August 2023, has representation of drug consumption rooms of all the countries in which these services were present. And I'm saying this because afterwards in the Czech Republic, a mobile drug consumption room opened. So that moment that country is not reflected. Uh, what we see is a bit of a confirmation of some of the trends that we normally see that normally drug consumption rooms, are in an urban city area, normally closed or within an open scene or concentrated in the use scene. And normally they are trying to be located within near major travel hubs as a way of facilitating accessibility. Or we start to see that oftentimes happens in the city periphery. And often when that happens has to do with being also in location when drug supply takes place. And then what we see here in the other is interesting because there is the mix with the rural. And then for this is a beautiful example. We see that, for example, in Luxembourg, we have a drug consumption room that happens in what is the border of a city or <laughs> a rural area in the location of 40,000 inhabitants. It becomes a beautiful and one of the unique examples of how a drug consumption room can operate within a smaller scale place. And what is the impact that is having? Uh, when it comes to the characteristics of the visitors and the people that they are coming, I chose this graph because specifically we were very much interested in looking in the role of drug consumption rooms within the integrated service or in <laughs> services. And there is two data in here which I really would like to bring your attention to. One is the percentage of people which are in OIG therapy already. So in this C, we say that actually it's not an oppositional situation. Oftentimes, drug consumption rooms are working in cooperation to refer us to OIT. But also we have an example in which there is a one drug consumption room in which OIT is integrated in the same facility that drug consumption takes place. Okay. So brings a bit of like this continuum that oftentimes is not opposed. And the other data that is interesting is that we see quite a high percentage of people that has been in abstinence related drug treatment before. So it means that drug consumption rules definitely are entering into contact not only with people that have a lot of uh, difficulties accessing services, but also people that have been already accessing certain services and for them has not been. <laughs> 
So in a way, we see how drug consumption rooms is really able to establish and maintain contact with organizations, or sorry, with services that the dead has not been. Also, it's important to see the aids that we're having in here, because oftentimes there is this idea of like, okay, what is going to be the role of promoting or inducing drug use? But definitely, we are seeing that definitely some people in which substance use is a part, a regular part of their life, and then they are providing this support in, in a way of doing it safely. Oftentimes, we are also saying, okay, drug consumption rooms are providing access to services that otherwise they wouldn't do. In here, we have quite an updated version of what is happening. Besides implementing a preventional and interventional strategies and actions for overdose prevention, what we see that as part of the core of the system it still keeps being access to materials that up until then has not been happening. And in comparison with other years, we see that a high number of drug consumption rooms are providing surfer in a lifetime supplies, which in a way is mirroring an increase of uh, actually a smoking as a preferred by of broad administration. We see drug counseling, basic existential needs, but something that I really would like to pay attention to you for you to go a bit more down is the introduction of fentanyl test strips and also drug checking. And this is moving into like how drug consumption rooms in one of their goals of preventing overdose and also to protect from drug toxic supply, is starting to integrate with other series of services that create a network of support and that actually takes into consideration the well-being of people with drugs. Drug checking can happen other on site, and at this moment in many places it has been a bit more as an experimental uh, or in a way of a um, pilot, which is in the case of Switzerland. In other times it's regular and it's done in a mobile case, like in the case of Barcelona, there's the drug service services that regular are passing on the services. In Denmark, it's completely integrated. So we see like different models of integrating these systems. Uh, also interesting that slowly, what they are bringing in there is also housing. And I'm seeing this that is interesting, and I'll go to this slide. Because if we see the typologies of these here settings, in one of the answers, we already integrated in housing services, but this typology starts to be a bit more complexified. Also, first, because there is drug consumption rooms in Europe, we didn't reply to this service in which housing is the main thing that they are doing. And then you have, for example, the, the shelter in Barcelona, in which actually they are offering not only housing, but also access to injecting and smoking. But in integrated care and in the other places specified, we see already examples in which drug consumption rooms or a company is starting to be integrated into hospitals, which in a way is putting into evidence how places which are normally going more like a treatment of care direction see the benefit of using this, particularly as a measure of avoiding um, voluntary discharge from the services and the health problems that create. And also what we see that is happening also within treatment services. As I was saying, there is an integration of OAT and drug attention groups. A right of administration, we can see all of them they are covering and becomes very interesting because up until now, this was not recognized. It's also creating the spots for the smoking. And then what we are seeing is that there has been like some drug attention groups that has been including this in a formal way, creating safety condition but also as a strategy to create an introduction of these services in places in which uh, the political climate and the debate is very complicated. So they start with the form that in principle is gonna be more accepted. And then from there, they build into creating the spaces for the role of administration. Lastly, an overview of the typologies of professionals. As you can see, uh, the idea behind the drug consumption room is being able to support the well-being, and this is done through multidisciplinary teams in many forms, in many shapes. The emphasis that we're looking is also the extent, and I'm not putting this in here, because we decided to conduct this surveys uh, in a way in which we are assuming that all of these different colleges of professions can be carried with people with lived, with living experience and without living experience. And that was a beautiful approach into really like putting forward the idea of how communities should be integrated also in the way we are looking into this, and then later on doing a follow-up question in which we see that year by year this is becoming increased. I'm very much aware, so we'll go quick later in the questions I can see in this. Yeah, I'll be brief, not quick. <laughs> Uh, and this is quite important because we are seeing that uh, we are speaking about the need for generating evidence, and we see that the majority of the drug consumption rooms already have been implementing monitoring and evaluation processes. Evaluation could be improved, but still half of them, they are looking at least into process evaluation. 
And this becomes interesting to see how drug consumption rooms are prepared in order to collect this data to adapt and implement to the constant changes that are happening in the market supply and in the communities, but also as a way of being really able to develop strategies of care and support that they are person-centered and they are really able to respond to the needs that are happening on the floor. There is a really important set of questions that we included in the survey, which I think is crucial and I will bring it in here. And the question is, since the opening of your drug consumption room, have you been observing any changes on a series of categories? <clears throat> One of the things that we see is like, since the opening of the drug consumption rooms, these facilities are uh, <clears throat> explaining how there has been an improved public perception, particularly in the neighborhoods and in the areas in which that has been happening. And this is thanks a lot to the work and the capacity that these centers has to establish relationships with the neighbors, do pedagogy, doing advocacy, building relationships with them, and now there's much more support. There is two examples in which support has decreased, and it's very interesting to see how the support has been decreasing because public amenities and safety has improved so much in the area that neighbors consider that these services are no longer required. So in a way also puts into evidence that actually there is an impact. Also between policymakers and law enforcement, there is an increased support in these places with drug obsession is happening. We see there has been an increased capacity, there is a higher demand, which in a way oftentimes is putting pressure on drug consumption rooms to be able to respond to the demand. And then it's actually calling for implementation of more facilities and more diverse facilities in different places, especially with a big emphasis in community-based and community-led fucking central rooms that they're able to be in spaces and in places that actually other models that are almost complex doesn't happen. We see an increased accessibility, and this particularly has to do with many drug consumption rooms that were only dedicated to injection, are including drugs of administration of also uh, <coughs> smoking. And we are seeing that also there is a capacity to respond to new substances. We see, for example, in the Netherlands, there is drug consumption rooms that they are starting to include the possibility to support the use of EHP because it has to do with responding with youth that are actually having problems with uh, access to housing, particularly LGBTQ youth, that they don't have any other safe place to be. So they create the contact to be able to be in there. And then as I was mentioning, we see an increased availability of drug consumption rooms, especially availability in Eastern Europe, which always has been a bit of a boundary when it was coming to drug consumption rooms, recently in the Czech Republic, recently in Athens and the Southern East was happening again. We are expecting two openings in Glasgow in Dublin this week, very much for a needed, and I'll leave it here for questions. Pass it to you. Thank you. Yeah, this was a good overview on uh, what is going on in the different museums across mm -hmm. Europe. So now we go to our last speaker. This is Hugo Faria. He is a team management at uh, Aresto Grignal, based in the Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Um, it's a very good opportunity for us to be here in this kind of setting to talk about the consumption of them. Um, so, I'm going to talk about our integrated support service, which is not only a drug consumption room. Uh, Arzupinal is an NGO that started working in 1986 in, uh, with the therapeutic community, and since then we have been doing other uh, stuff, other projects in arm reduction with a mobile methadone problem, for example. And uh, just to underline the 20, from 2021, we also uh, uh, are managing uh, an arm reduction project with a drug consumption room inside of the municipal uh, shelter that we have in Lisbon, and also the, the drug consumption room itself that started also in May 2021. So this history, like the Dr. João Golau said um, in the beginning, uh, started in 2001 with the decriminalization law that we have in Portugal that allowed to drug consumption rooms to become a reality. But for some reasons, um, only in 2019 opened the first one, uh, the mobile one. The initial project was to have one mobile uh, and two fixed. We opened the mobile, opened the other fixed one, the one that we are running uh, since 2021, and the other fixed one uh, plant uh, never uh, opened. We have now a new um, community-based uh, consumption room from our partners from GAT, um, but in another one in Porto. This history started, it was a pilot, so the municipality of Lisbon uh, was um, sponsoring the, this project until the last September, and since then 
it's a national project uh, sponsored by ITA. We started uh, with a social diagnosis around 2016, 2017. Then uh, we we did the, the choose of the location. It was created a monitoring committee, many meetings. That but at some point, uh, the community asked the world to say something about it. Uh, and even <laughs> if they were were not against the the, the, the drug consumption room in their neighborhood, because they were very aware of the, the, the reality of this neighborhood with a lot of drug trafficking and drug use around, they were they were um, intended to be uh, to have some structural structural things uh, sold in the neighborhood. So things like a, a consistent water supply system for the neighborhood, uh, a bus that can uh, link them to the other parts in the city because it is, this is not a ghetto, but it's, it's treated like a ghetto. Uh, and uh, fortunately, the municipality of Lisbon were uh, was very sensitive to these questions, and they solved these questions, and then we could open um, our DCR. So we are placed uh, inside of the red circle, uh, very near uh, with the Camp de Rig, which is a very fancy um, neighborhood in Lisbon, which is also the reason of some tensions with the local authority. <laughs> while we, we were then in a very early. So this is uh, the neighborhood. Um, it was uh, since the beginning of the 90s, uh, like a big shanty town that was relocated um, to new buildings, like you can see on the that photo on the right, that this is our DCR. Um, it was relocated since the 1990, uh, 1999. So our main objectives are the same that uh, we were talking since the beginning of this session, so to promote the dignity, to promote a, a safer use of drugs, but also to have a role uh, with the community. So try to reduce some of the noise that the drug use uh, in an open scene uh, makes around. Um, to do this, we have this facility. So we have an intravenous room, a smoking room, a place where people can have a, a medical appointment or a nursing appointment, a psychosocial um, support office, a coffee and comfort area, a social area, places where people can leave the pets and smoke cigarettes, and also a place for laundry, showers, and so our community team goes around the, the, the community, the neighborhoods every day to try to pick up some syringes and also to be um, close to, to the population. In a good day, we can have nine people working. It doesn't happen every day. So also one of the issues of our work. So in a regular day, we can have more than 200 uh, entries in a place, uh, 120 different people, 140 consumption, 90 snacks to live, eight showers, five social appointments, four medical appointments, and 80 nursing uh, education acts. Um, just to say that decreased a lot, uh, a lot, not a lot, but some, because we had to to decrease also the schedule of our room because of financial issues. And so this is the, the consequence. Our population are uh, mainly composed by men uh, with an average age around 47, coming mostly from Portugal, but also coming from uh, some other countries in Asia and Europe. Um, Right now, we have 2,500 more than that uh, registrations in our service, which is far more than we expected in the beginning. Uh, in terms of some data, uh, we when we opened, we we were we were opening a drug consumption rule, a safe injection site for say that. But what we realized was that the smoked population was the, the majority. Uh, and we now uh, still have uh, smoking consumption as the main uh, way of use. Uh, regarding the air, airwind in the smoking consumption room, it's the most uh, used substance, and the, in the injection room is the speedball or the airwind and cocaine. Just to say that when we see here cocaine, we mean crack cocaine. In terms of overdoses, we had 52 in total, 42 inside and 10 uh, nearby. We were asked to help if someone that was in overdose. 
because we have a psychosocial support, uh, we also uh, are able to do some social and health referrals, which is very important in our work. And in terms of syringes collected around 140,000, almost uh, it was the last year of data. Uh, some pictures of the place. And just to finish with what say that we have some challenges. We have been some, uh, having some challenges since the beginning. We still have some. Uh, some of them are the budgets, always the budget, uh, but I think that arm reduction and uh, addiction services are not well funded. Um, and I, I would like to say also that since the beginning, we have all the rooms completely full, uh, or mostly the, the smoked room. But now this week, we have been uh, negotiating with the municipality of Lisbon, and probably in the near future, we will be able to, to double the capacity of the smoking room. Uh, soon, so it's a very good new uh, news. Uh, this is the team that uh, makes this possible, and thank you. Uh, I'm available for any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, uh, surprisingly, we didn't uh, make it in time, but uh, as far as I know. <laughs> There is no uh, session plan, so I would like to open the door. Uh, floor for question. <laughs> open the door and open the door for question, comment, remark, reflections. I know, and I see that there are different people. Uh, they need ah no. Ben was first. <laughs> ben, uh, <laughs> um, my question was for the Hugo. I saw the, the average age of your clients was 47. Do you do you see any younger people come in? And if not, why do you think younger people struggle to engage with services in the same way as the older demographic? Uh, we see some younger people, not uh, Portuguese people. Uh, we the, young, the younger people that we, we have having in our service are people coming from Asia. That, uh, this, this is a phenomenon that we have uh, now in Portugal. Um, uh, Portuguese younger people, no, no. Uh, under 20, I think we have two people. Um, no, from 20 to 20, 25, two people. So it's not a concern. Yeah, what am I doing? Well, I think this is a younger people, uh, usually uh, in general, they don't have this kind of uh, use. This is a drug consumption room. It's a very um, um, important facility for people who really need this kind of facility. So this started uh, to to solve, to to, like, to to give a service to people that are living on the street, for example, people that have, have no conditions to have uh, safer use. So usually younger people from our perspective are in other level of using, uh, maybe more recreational, or even if it's not only recreational, they don't come. Thank you. Um, I have uh, one question, uh, uh, just to clarify if I understood right, and uh, uh, well, and a comment at the request, let's say. Uh, my question is uh, for Roberto: uh, If um, you have in this in that uh, study uh, updated study about the CRs, if you have included in modern year uh, or not, because it is it has kind of a different status because it's it didn't come out the same way as Argentinal and the other one. So this is the question. Um, and my comment is about the feeling of uh, knowing several VCRs and looking at the the, the attempt to characterize each DCR, uh, the types of DCRs. Uh, I kind of uh, uh, miss uh, kind of uh, something that tells me about uh, more uh, the vibe of the DCR. This would interest me. <laughs> What's the vibe? What can we say? And uh, uh, so the request would be uh, to uh, uh, to uh, amplify uh, uh, the assessment uh, uh, because who is doing the assessment and for who 
uh, is this assessment done? And there are different, so but the, uh, um, in terms of the perspective of the drug users, uh, I think there are other features of uh, the PCRs that we <laughs> would like to uh, see. Uh, and of course, uh, the idea, uh, the part that you were mentioning about the uh, peer workers, uh, we live or live in experience, all those are very, uh, are issues with some tension because uh, it crosses uh, several things. Um, and well, I would like to see if more work done in that. Uh... From the top to the bottom. Uh, yes, DAT was part of this study. Uh, I will take this uh, study, uh, I will contextualize this study and it has to do really well with what you were putting forward with the idea of the qualities of drug and sanction groups. And also because there is a certain almost opposition at a certain point between medicalized drug consumption rooms, community-based drug consumption rooms, and what we are seeing that at the moment, like this way of categorizing. It does not serve any purpose because when we speak about integrated drug consumption rooms, at the end of the day, all are actually integrated drug consumption rooms, either because they co-locate services or because they have established referral pathways to be able to mm -hmm. integrate with the organization. So definitely, indeed, there's different entry point that is needed. For us, mm -hmm. understanding this model of care, what we're trying to look is into the location of the places in which this takes place. And also looking into like moving forward, to see that drug consumption rooms is not as such typology of service, but accompanied consumption can take place in many different places. As we are seeing, it's becoming integrated in communities, it's integrated in housing services, it's integrated into hospitals, into treatment, into low threshold facilities. So in a way, what it would be interesting to see and what this give us, like example like DAT, is that there is a possibility you don't need to develop a really complex medical service to create a drug consumption room. Oftentimes, if you depart from the reality of your community and already what exists in there, you resource and support, integration of safer use can take place and it's very effective as well. And with this, it's this idea of like, let's try to find strategies that cut it for everybody because in some places there is a need for more medical help and support and that's very required. In other places, the use is different. And then now we are seeing like this comprehensive evidence is less support is happening across different places, across different modalities, as a way of creating a comprehensive continuum here. Um, yes, uh, thank you for giving the floor. I'm Denis Hubert, the executive secretary of the Pompidou Group of the Council of Europe. And uh, I wanted to mention that um, we have launched uh, back in 2019 a European process uh, to raise awareness among uh, our member states. We have 41 member states uh, about drug consumption rooms. Why did we do that? It's because, uh, first of all, it's a European, it's much a, very much a European model. Um, it has been created back in the 80s in Switzerland and it exists uh, as of Today, in 10 European countries, which has already been mentioned, and plus soon, soon two more, the UK and, uh, and Ireland. And uh, in the rest of the world, you, uh, I think there are only two other countries uh, which are using this model, Canada and Australia. So it's very much a European model, uh, and uh, it is still the subject of a lot of uh, controversies. Because, as I mentioned, 41 member states and the popular group, only two, 10 European countries are applying the model. So we, we thought it was important to raise awareness and to promote uh, this because we have uh, scientific evidence about the positive effects of the drug consumption rules in the field of harm reduction. It has been mentioned by ICLA already, who is, by the way, also part of this uh, process. Uh, and uh, we have had three. Uh, European uh, seminars on drug and social rules, um, one in April 2019, the second one in July 2021, and the third one in uh, May 2023. So the, the idea is to have it every two years and to share experiences, good practices, but also problem difficulties 
and also to highlight the respective roles of uh, uh, those who are running the, the drug consortium room, mostly civil society organizations, those who are uh, financing them and helping them to exist, local authorities, and also those who are allowing or not them to exist, national authorities. And I, uh, we will have the, the first the first one, so we will continue the process every next next year in 2025. So I invite uh, all interested mm -hmm. people. Some of them are already there. Uh, Roberto also has been involved, and um, we will continue because we believe that this is a model which uh, deserves to be promoted, uh, and we will continue also to go beyond the boundaries of. Uh, of uh, Europe, La the last time we had uh, Canada and Australia participating <coughs> in the in, in the in the seminar, and the seminar will take place as it has been the case before in the Council of Europe in Strasbourg in spring next year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm from Canada. Uh, we have 40 drug consumption rooms. Approximately. I'm curious though around the smoking rooms um, and how those operate and are they properly ventilated or uh, to staff go in? Uh, we have 22 people dying every day across Canada. Over half of those are from smoking and none of those consumption sites are out smoking right now. Uh, and then maybe I have a comment as well, but just curious about the smoking piece first. Uh, our smoking uh, room is well ventilated, a yeah. uh, small space, but uh... People can can be there without uh, smoke, uh, so it was um, a necessity for them before opening. And I know there are uh, other others. other kinds of. Uh, okay, there's a bit of a diversity in here. Definitely, you have drug consumption rooms that have the smoking, but particularly in those with more resources, and we have some decorated quite well established ventilation systems. And there is some information if you want that I can pass you the technical part of this. Also, what we are seeing that these drug consumption rules that what they are doing is creating a bit of an alternative because they know that the demand is so high and instead they want to create a work that oftentimes has to do with, like if we have an open path within the facilities, then we will allow this to happen. Yeah. And then that's considered in this place. The situation that we have been here, also as Hugo was mentioning, is that policy support exists in there, but oftentimes the frameworks that exist they create boundaries to create an increase of uh, funding to be really able to implement and to continue developing these services. So they are maintained, but also like how often in many countries they are like very vulnerable, that allows for not being able to provide it. So there's a bit of a mix between very well developed smoking rooms and more let's play with what we have on the styles. And uh, so we've had uh, the talks at uh, suppliers changing with those concerns now with staff safety and inhalation. I think, uh, I don't know if you've been seeing that, but now we've got Ministry of Labor involved and this is closing some sites. So uh, there's some concern there. Maybe I just also make a quick comment to people that haven't considered it. It's great you have all this public support because in Canada, we're getting some resistance now because they haven't been scaled. So if you haven't implemented these, I would encourage governments here, if you're, if you're going to scale bigger than you anticipate because otherwise you'll get traffic jams, people hanging outside. Um, just don't underestimate how many people want these services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's a uh, it's a question about funding uh, for whoever has uh, has something has an input on that. Uh, I'm from Oslo, uh, also the EU, where we have one um, one uh, DCR, and uh, 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 we call this sort of Kafkaesque problem we have uh, in Oslo is that uh, the uh, the DCR is only for people are registered living inside Oslo County. And I uh, I heard you, uh, Hugo, uh, mention that you have visitors from other countries. And how did the discussion on who's going to pay for this or where is the money going to come from? Where, uh, how did you go through that? And how would you like uh, land such a, a great solution as you have? Well, for now, it is not uh, a discussion related to the nationality of people who are going to the services, but probably, I don't know, with the elections, with the writing, uh, probably it will be an issue. 
right now and until now is not an issue. So even not only in the reconsumption room, but in many other uh, health services and addiction services, the nationality or the, the condition that people have in the country, if they are illegal or not, uh, it's not a uh, limit to access that. So the, the, the funding problem is not uh, over there. The, the one that I've mentioned is uh, on the, the side of inside. It's inside. It's from the staff. Uh, it's from the facility. Uh, it's it's for them. It's not for the, the client. For them. Hello, my name is Bahar Joshkun from Turkey. Uh, it's clear that naloxone is served, is services offered on those uh, rooms, but I wonder if those uh, naloxone products are easily accessible and free in pharmacies of uh, Portugal or Europe. Well, uh, I can talk in our perspective, in our case, uh, we are now we have we are um, uh, we have all the naloxone that we need even for the community distribution mm -hmm. uh, for free. Uh, yes, it wasn't there like that in the beginning, but it was a process and now we are uh, for free. Mm -hmm. It really depends. I mean, we see in countries in which actually access to Nalasan is happening in the standardizing facilities because there is worse of vaccinated pharmacies. So, and also we see that it depends on where and who is allowed to be able to provide it. Because there is drug and central rooms in countries in which actually only medical health mm -hmm. is able to provide it. So that gets in the way of the Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just one question for uh, colleagues from Portugal, uh, maybe also for Mr. Bulao. Uh, how are these uh, mobile? Uh, Conduction rooms organized, uh, having in mind that uh, you said that you almost have a nine staff some, from time to time in the at the same time there. And uh, I presume that uh, some of them are doctors, psychological uh, uh, people, and uh, nurses. And uh, how do you organize those people to have them? Is that some kind of a truck or a van or going from place to place? And uh, do you have all those people at the same time? Mm -hmm. Available. In our case, our facility is not mobile, so uh, it's fixed. So we have all that people, all that, all that staff, multidisciplinary team, in the fixed facility. But I know that in the mobile consumption uh, room, they have two people uh, at the same time. So one educator, uh, a worker, and a nurse. Uh, and they build around the, the, the city. They have uh, usually a previous schedule, uh, places to stop, and, and a schedule. Um, and that's it. Our it's different. We can talk. So, Al, you want to comment ah, on this? Well, just uh, to, to join Hugo is exactly like this. Uh, there are uh, pre scheduled places where the, the van stops uh, mm -hmm. at a given, given time and a uh, given place. So, uh, the, the users know uh, that uh, schedule. And there's a limited staff. Uh, we used to have uh, also a, a van that performs uh, uh, drug checking uh, at a, in given days are all uh, together to the uh, to the uh, mobile unit uh, for for use. People can can present their samples uh, to be analyzed prior to to use. There's a as a synergy of two, of two organizations working together. Okay. Uh, in terms of time, I guess Hugo... Yeah, just to add yeah, something yeah. to this, because uh, one of the better things that the mobile consumption room could offer is the possibility of changing the place. So, for example, this month, they they are staying in uh, stopping in a, in a specific area of consumption that is needed to stop there, but in the next month, they can talk with the authorities and change the, the place, which is very, very important. So in terms of time, uh, I'm here already nearly 20 minutes late, I think. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, I would like to give ECR a last word, probably, and then Roberto, and then we close. 
Thank you, Catherine. So yeah, I think um, I would like to insist in uh, the need of uh, considering evaluation as one of the key elements that will help to really better understand and be able to support decision making, to inform decision making in a way that we can advance the whole discussion on drug consumption rooms to a next level. That would be my final takeoff. Oh, yeah. I would like to amplify what you are saying because aligns a lot what we're promoting here. If you're going to be implementing a drug consumption room plan for having more than one facility and probably a mix of services, half a stick to two mobiles, because it's going to have the same public debate, but it's going to put less pressure and probably respond to more places. So if you're going to jump and do it, calculate and generate more than one. So, how you want to give a last? Board. Yes, uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, well, what what I think it's important to keep in mind is that the, these facilities are just one part of a broader strategy, uh, and they they are very useful uh, in my view uh, to to gain the, the confidence of the of the users and to connect them to health personnel. So we can work closely and work effectively in uh, in increasing their levels of uh, of uh, quality of life. Uh, so uh, and it is it must be an open gate for other other kind of responses. So it's a, a way to 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 attract people to interconnect and to uh, uh, to work with with them. Offering the, the the also the fulfillment of their basic needs in terms of hygiene, in terms of clothing, in close, uh, in terms of access to healthcare, and I think our facility in Lisbon that uh, you will uh, describe is uh, a very good example of that. Thank you, thank you, and congratulations for this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we are closing now. I think we heard quite some things. I mean, uh, Isia clearly indicated we need more research and more evaluation. I think that's clear. I also see that there are, um, it's important to keep in mind that there are new trends and new developments. And I think the funding part is an important element, not only because it limits the access and the availability to services, but also because it can really undermine in the long term the impact of services and also the political support in the long run. So I think uh, we need to work on different levels. And uh, I would like to invite all of you to talk to the speakers and to link with each other so there is more information and we can um, discuss it after. So thanks a lot to all the speakers, thanks a lot to all of you and for your patience staying on. Sorry, <laughs> 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 <laughs>